I'm very pleased to welcome another distinguished representative of the um, of the Office of Legal Affairs of the IEA by the name of Sylvain Fianel. Uh, Fanel, uh, Sylvain is a legal officer with the section. Uh, his background is very much about non-proliferation and safeguards. He has been working with, uh, from Belgium, his home country, with the Belgium Federal Agency for Nuclear Control. And he was uh, also, <coughs> at the time, if I'm correct, uh, you were attached with the University of right. Liège in, in Belgium and already working um, on the same subject. So it's uh, really a pleasure, uh, apart from the fact that it's dear to me, is a former alumni of the University of Montpellier. It's my pleasure, Sylvain, to invite you to in start your presentation. Thank you Thank very you. much, Patrick. Is the, is the microphone working? Is it strong enough? Okay. Well, I'm, first let me know, uh, I would like to tell you I'm delighted to be here. The landscape is beautiful. If I would have known that, I would try to arrive a bit earlier. But I also know it's 2 p.m., so it's an uh, extremely challenging time frame, especially to discuss legal aspect on, on, on safeguards. So I will try to uh, make this as interactive as possible. I will move a lot just to keep you awake in the digestion process. Please really do not hesitate to uh, interrupt me. Okay, if you have any question, if anything is, is unclear, do not hesitate at all. So the, I will try to, so the objective of, of this presentation is to provide you with an overview of uh, the IA legal framework for safeguards. And it's divided into five main parts. First, a more, I would say, historical introduction. Then we, would move, we will move to the legal aspect in the IA uh, statute related to safeguards. And then the core part of the presentation, the safeguards agreements, then the additional protocol and other protocols to the safeguards agreement, and finally, the implementation of safeguards, so how safeguards are implemented at um, the IEA and by the IEA. So I decided to take a more historical um, approach because the legal instruments we have nowadays in the field of safeguards are the results of decision from the international community to avoid any proliferation of nuclear weapons and to avoid that this technology, this know-how, uh, would be used for destructive purposes. So we will go a bit uh, back in time. I'm pretty sure many of you here are much more expert than me in the field of nuclear science. So I will just uh, provide a very quick uh, overview to give um, the framework. So in 1938, Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner continue the work of Enrico Fermi and discover uh, nuclear uh, fission. With this increasing discovery and the, the follow-up to this main discovery, Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard started to be worried about the potential misuse of the nuclear technology, the nuclear know-how. So they warned uh, the US president on these potential uh, misuse. In 1940, in the context of the Manhattan Project, Glenn Seaborg discovers plutonium, which will play a key role in the Manhattan Project itself. And as we all know, the first nuclear weapon explosion was undertaken in July 1945 by the US. It's the Trinity test and followed by the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945. So very quickly, the international community tried to address the new challenges posed by this new technology, all these new discoveries in the field of nuclear science. The first one is the Three Nation Declaration made by the Three Nation Committee, which is Canada, the US, and the UK. And by that time, these were the states holding the nuclear technology. And they called for an exchange of information regarding nuclear technology for the benefit of mankind. But very importantly, they already raised the idea of having an authority, and they used the word a commission, to uh, control the potential misuse of, of this new uh, technology. 
it's then not a surprise that the first United Nations General Assembly resolution was related to uh, nuclear disarmament and the threat posed by uh, nuclear weapons. And this first UN resolution created the UNAEC, so the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. And the purpose of this commission was to address the challenges posed by um, nuclear technology. So in the next three years, discussion went on in the UN, within this UNAEC, on how to address these threats. And there are two main plans, two main ideas that came up during these three years. It's the Baruch plan from the US side, and the Baruch plan called for the establishment of an international atomic development authority. In exchange of the creation of this authority, the US would give up its nuclear weapon, but on the other side, this plan established an entire system of control on nuclear material to avoid that this nuclear material would be used for uh, destructive purposes. On the other side, we have the Soviet Union plan, the Gromkio plan, and this plan focused on um, a convention, a convention that would prohibit the manufacture and the employment of nuclear weapons. So on the US side, we have the idea of control, and on the Soviet Union side, we have the idea of this convention of a legally binding instrument. But unfortunately, all these efforts, these three years discussion collapsed in 1949 with the first Soviet Union uh, nuclear weapon test. By that time, the international community that uh, considered that the proliferation was started, and therefore, this discussion in this framework, it was very difficult to move for forward. So the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission stopped its work, its work in 1949, and it was a bit of a deadlock for uh, a few years. Until 1953, with the famous Atoms for Peace speech of President Eisenhower. And he revived the discussion started in the framework of the UNAEC, and give, I would say, a second impulse to this, discuss to this discussion. So he provided the idea of having an international atomic energy agency, which would be set up under the aegis of the United Nations. There would be a system of worldwide inspection and control. So this is coming from the idea from the Baruch plan. So control on nuclear activities, on nuclear material. And this International Atomic Energy Agency would be to devise methods whereby this fissionable material, so the nuclear material, would be allocated to serve peaceful purposes. This led to the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the statute was negotiated between 1953 and 1956 and entered into force now a bit uh, more than 70 years ago, we celebrated in July when everyone was on holiday, the anniversary of uh, the IEA um, statute. Important is that the IEA is not a UN organization. It is a related organization. We do have a specific relationship with the United Nations. We report annually to the General Assembly, for example, but also in the process of non-compliance to safeguards agreements, and I will come back to that later, we have a specific access to, um, to the United Nations Security Council. The IA has two policy-making organs, the General Conference, Conference sorry, which will meet in three weeks in Vienna. They meet you regularly one time per year, and it gathers the representative of all uh, member states. They approve the budget, but they also they deal with any matters raised to it by the Board of Governors, second policy-making organs, by member states um, or by the director general. We then have the Board of Governors. It's the executive body of the IEA responsible to carry out the functions of the agency. The staff is headed by the director general, which is Yukiya Amano from Japan, and the IEA has currently 168 uh, member states. 
So now let's move to uh, the core of the presentation, to safeguards. So first, what are uh, safeguards? I wanted to ask the question, but of course, if I put the slide, it's going to be very useless. So the safeguards are a set of technical measures enabling the IEA to verify that states are honoring their international obligations to use nuclear material and technology exclusively for peaceful purposes. These international obligations come from different instruments. The IEA statute, I will come back to that in one or two slides, also from bilateral or multilateral treaties, and from safeguards agreements and the protocol thereto. What are the safeguards activities of the agency? These are the numbers of uh, 2016. So safeguards are currently implemented. So we apply this set of technical measures in 188, 81 sorry, states. Over 1,200 facilities and material balanced area outside facilities are covered by safeguards. Last year, over 2,800 verification missions from IEA inspectors. And finally, there are over 200,000 significant quantities of nuclear material under safeguards. What is a significant quantity? It's the quantity that is required to manufacture a nuclear weapon. It's a standard established by um, the IEA. So it would be 54 kilos of uranium and 8 kilos of uh, plutonium. What is the statute saying? And I will just take the statute. I forget it at the back of the room so that you can have a look. So I will circulate this uh, orange book, which is the statute. And I guess you know already the statute. So <laughs> there you are. So, so Article 3A5 of the statute provides that the IEA is, um, is authorized to establish and administer safeguards in three situations. First, in the context of agency project and assistance. So the agency can provide equipment, provide material to states at the request of the state, but at the condition that this material or this equipment is covered by safeguards. Second, scenario, it's at the request of parties to any bilateral or multilateral uh, arrangement. Bilateral uh, agreement is, for example, a supply agreement. So a, a supplier state will provide nuclear material to a recipient state at the condition that this material is covered by safeguards. So at the condition that the recipient states enters into an agreement with the IEA to have this material covered by uh, safeguards. The case of multilateral agreements, it's, for example, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but I will discuss that in a few minutes. And last possibility, it's at the request of a state to any of that state's nuclear activities. So a state can decide to ask the IEA to have certain material covered by um, safeguards. And the second article where we have provisions related to safeguards in the statute it's in Article 12. It's, I would say, the more general safeguards provisions. For example, we will have uh, information on the fact that states have to keep records related to nuclear material, but also provide reports to the IEA. And main, I would say, provisions related to inspection. And Article 12, also in its paragraph C, has um, the process of non-compliance to the Security Council and the General Assembly. Yeah? So the supplier state will say to the recipient state, we can provide you nuclear material but only at the condition that you enter in an agreement with the agency to have this material, the one we will provide, covered by safeguards. Because the, the supplier states wants insurance that this material is not used 
for descriptive purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the context, in the context of bilateral uh, agreement. We need a safeguards agreement to implement safeguards. No, no, but I, I will discuss that later. So the additional protocol is not a standalone document. So you need to have a safeguards agreement if the state wants to conclude an additional protocol. So the starting point is a safeguard agreement. The IEA can't just go in a state and say, we will apply safeguards. We need a legal framework. And this is given by the statute, but mainly also by the safeguards agreement itself we have with the state. But if it's not clear afterwards, we can, we can come back to that. But more information will be provided um, later on. A few things, general comments uh, regarding IEA safeguards. Safeguards provision of the statute are not self-executing. Uh, it means that states need to have a safeguard agreement. This is related to what I just said. States need to have a safeguard agreement for the IEA to apply safeguards in uh, that uh, state. The IEA membership does not require the acceptance of safeguards. We do have IEA members which do not have uh, safeguards agreement with the IEA. So it's not because you are a member of the agency that you need to have a safeguard agreement. And lastly, IEA safeguards are possible in non-member states. So we could have states which are non-member to the agency, but still they have a safeguards agreement because it's an international legal instrument. You don't need to be a member state to have such international legal instruments in force. So now it's the uh, main part of, of the presentation, the safeguards agreements. And here I insist, if anything is, is unclear, please do not hesitate to uh, interrupt me. So the thing to remember is there are three types of safeguards agreement. First, we have this item-specific safeguards agreement, which are based on a document called Information Circular 66. So the content of these agreements are based on this document, which is available online uh, on the agency's website. In the context of these item-specific safeguards agreement, <coughs> safeguards will apply only to specific items which are provided for in the agreement itself. Nuclear equipment, nuclear material, for example, we would have these few tons of equipment is covered by safeguards. So the, the material covered by safeguards is very uh, clearly identifiable in the agreement itself. And the purpose of these agreements is to verify that these items, the one subject to safeguards and identified in the agreement, are not diverted for the manufacture of nuclear weapons or any other explosive device. We currently have three states with item-specific safeguards agreement, so based on the content of the document Information Circular 66, it's Israel, Pakistan, and India. For the comprehensive safeguard agreement, this is the main type of agreement. We currently have 173 states with these types of agreement in force. And here, the safeguards will apply to all material in all peaceful activities in a state. So here, it's not only specific items which are identified in the agreement itself. It's on all nuclear material in all peaceful activities in a state. And the purpose of this agreement is to verify that nuclear materials subject to safeguards are not diverted to nuclear weapons or any other nuclear explosive device. And finally, the voluntary offer agreement. These, in, this context of, of, in the context of these agreements, safeguards will apply to nuclear material facilities that nuclear weapon states, and I will come back to the distinction in a few minutes, that nuclear weapon states has offered for safeguards and have been selected by the IEA. So nuclear weapon states will offer a list of facilities with nuclear material, and the IEA can choose facilities, or just don't choose any facility, in which safeguards will be applied. And in the context of these safeguards agreement, the objective is to verify that the nuclear material covered by safeguard remain in peaceful activities and it's and not withdrawn from safeguards 
unless provided on the condition in the safeguard argument itself. And we have currently five states uh, with a voluntary, agreement in, a voluntary affair agreement in force, which are the five nuclear open states. Why do we have many types of agreement? Not fair. Well, this is coming mainly from a distinction that I will explain in three slides on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Okay. So the process of including and implementing safeguards agreement, the IEA Board of Governors will approve the safeguard agreement. So you remember the Board of Governors, it's the executive body of the agency. And so the board will authorize the Director General to conclude and implement a safeguard agreement. The Director General will then, will then discuss with the state, conclude the safeguard agreement, and implement safeguards in the state in accordance with the provision, of course, of the agreement. And all the agreements are available online on our website, and they are published under these documents or information circular. And, and uh, this agreement uh, should follow one of these uh, three types, right? Well, we only have three types of safeguards agreements. Yes. So that, uh, they will conclude the director general. Yeah. Uh, one of these types, right? Yeah. And then the board. We, uh, sorry, the Director General will report to the Board on the implementation of these agreements on, in, uh, on an annual basis in the Safeguards Implementation Report. Uh, the executive summary of this uh, SIR, so Safeguards Implementation Report, is available online, uh, but the content is, is um, restricted. So, if you remember, there are three situations in which um, the IEA will be authorized to establish and administer safeguards in the context of agency projects and assistance at the request of states parties to any bilateral or multilateral treaties. Here we move to multilateral treaties requiring the application of safeguards. The most important one of the, these two, um, the nuclear weapon free zones. So I don't know if some of you are familiar with these nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, so these are treaties establishing geographical zones without, uh, sorry, zones in which nuclear weapons are prohibited. And these nuclear weapon free zone treaties will have provision uh, requiring state parties to these treaties to conclude a safeguards agreement with the agency. We have, for example, the Treaty of Bangkok establishing a zone in Southeast Asia, or the Treaty of Tlatetolco, establishing such a zone in Latin America and the Caribbean. Other type of multilateral uh, treaty, it's the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, which is maybe the most known one. And this treaty so entered into force on 5th of March, 1970. It has three main pillars, but here I have to insist that this notion of pillars are not per se provided in the treaty. It's more a practice that experts refer to it as pillars. So three main historical pillars, I would say. Non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, the obligation of disarmament, Article 6, and the obligation to um, use nuclear material, nuclear energy, nuclear know-how for uh, peaceful purposes. And uh, uh, all the states parties to the NPT will meet every five years during a review conference. And uh, the three years preceding the review conference, there will be a preparatory committee. So all the states party will meet three times before this review conference to discuss the implementation of the treaty and to prepare this uh, review conference. In 1995, states parties decided to extend indefinitely the duration of the NPT. And very, very important notion, you will see in a few minutes, is this notion of nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. 
So nucle nuclear weapon states are defined in the NPT, and they are states who tested or exploded a nuclear weapon prior the 1st of January 1967. These are China, the UK, US, Russia, and France. The non-nuclear weapon states are not defined in the treaty, but de facto, it's all the others. So all, all other states which did not tested uh, a nuclear weapon prior to the 1st of January 1967. Essential aspect, which is sometimes confusing in the media, but the IEA is not a party to the NPT. It is not the role of the IEA to comment on the compliance or non-compliance of a state party to the NPT. What is required under the NPT? Well, there will be different obligations depending if you are a nuclear weapon state or a non-nuclear weapon state. So Article 2 provides that a non-nuclear weapon state can't acquire nuclear weapons or any other explosive devices. These non-nuclear weapon states, and this is essential for the future of the lecture, they have to accept safeguards as set forth in an agreement with the agency and in accordance with the agency statute and the agency safeguard system. So nuclear, non-nuclear weapon states party to the treaty have the obligation to accept safeguards in a safeguard agreement with the IEA. And these safeguards shall be applied on all source or special fissionable material in all peaceful activities within the territory of the state under its direct jurisdiction, sorry, or control anywhere. And Article 3, Paragraph 4 provides that these agreements need to be negotiated and concluded within 18 months. Now, let's compare a bit the, the, um, the safeguards agreement. So if you remember, I told you that the item-specific safeguards agreement cover only specific item, uh, item which are defined and identified in the agreement itself. So with these types of agreement, this is the very simplified version of the nuclear fuel cycle. With these types of uh, agreement, the IEA will be able to implement safeguards in conversion plant, fuel fabrication plant, reactors and critical assemblies, and reprocessing plants. Initially, it was only reactors and criti critical assemblies, but it was extended to other types of uh, facilities of the nuclear uh, fuel cycle. Now, let's move to the content of the comprehensive safeguard agreement. So here, safeguards will be applied on all source or special fissionable material. Everything you need to know on comprehensive safeguards agreement are provided here in Information Circular 153. Please have a look on uh, this document, which is divided into two parts. First, part one, the general provisions, and second, it's the specific procedures on how safeguards are applied. So following the uh, entry into force of the NPT, so the Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, the Board of Governors established a committee uh, within the Secretariat, and this committee, known as Committee 22, was, respon uh, was responsible to consider the content of agreement required in connection with Article 3 of the, uh, of the NPT. And the Board approved that document, that blue document, um, in 1973. Uh, this is not a standardized document. It means that between comprehensive safeguard agreement, you can have uh, small differences, but overall, the structure and the content are uh, very similar. But it is not a model. And this is important to highlight because the additional protocol, I will discuss that in a few minutes, is a model, so you have to accept all the provisions. Here, it's not the case. Um, there is a small quantity protocol to this uh, comprehensive to this comprehensive safeguard agreement, and this small quantity protocol is available only for states with very little or no nuclear material. 
The notion of subsidiary arrangement. So in addition to this main comprehensive safeguard agreement, the IEA will conclude subsidiary arrangement with the state. And this subsidiary arrangement contains a general part, which will describe how safeguards will be implemented in the state. An example of provisions in these subsidiary arrangements is the communication channel to whom the IEA has to communicate regarding safeguards aspect. This is the type of information you will find in the, in the subsidiary arrangement. What is nuclear material? Well, nuclear material is defined in Article 20 of the statute, so the Orange Book. And it's any source or special fissionable material which correspond overall to uranium, thorium, and plutonium. Under comprehensive safeguard agreement, nuclear material does not include all or all residues so in the mines and in the mining activities. Regarding the safeguards procedures, safeguards measures will be different depending on the type of material. If the nuclear material, so uranium thorium or plutonium 239, is suitable for fuel fabrication or isotopic enrichment, then all safeguards measures in part two of this document of information circular 153 will be applicable. If it's not the case, so if it does not have yet if it's not yet suitable for fuel fabrication or isotopic enrichment then only limited safeguards measures will be applicable so the states will have for example to inform the IEA on import and export of uh, nuclear material unless this material is used for uh, non uh, nuclear purposes such as ceramics uh, for example and i repeat under the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement, safeguards do not apply to material in mining or milling activities, so the beginning of the nuclear fuel cycle. In the CSA, so in the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement, you have different rights and obligations. And these rights and obligations are upon states, but also on the agency. We also do have obligations. So the state has the general obligation to accept safeguards as provided in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty on all nuclear material in all peaceful activities within its territory, jurisdiction, or control anywhere. The IEA has the right, but also the obligation to apply safeguards. Another obligation on both, we have the obligation to cooperate to ensure that the, the provisions are correctly implemented. Do we have the obligation to communicate with each other in the context of the implementation of safeguards? The IA is required also to maintain confidentiality on the information collected in the context of the implementation of safeguards. The IA receives tons of information every single day on the nuclear fuel cycle of states. This information is obviously sensitive so we have to ensure at the agency that this information remains confidential and is not going out in uh, the public. The state has the obligation to establish and maintain a, maintain a state system of accounting for or control nuclear material. It means that the states need to have a system to count its nuclear material. To be able to say, we have such amount of nuclear material, this is where it's located. This is the type of information that has to be provided to the IEA. So it's, re it's referred to as SSAC or also RSAC for regional. I don't know if some people here are familiar with the Euratom system for European um, uh, member states, and they have a regional accounting system. But it's also the case for ABAC, so for Argentina and uh, Brazil. The procedures regarding safeguards while well, state have the obligation to keep records and provide reports to uh, the IEA. Uh, and obviously state has the obligation also to provide access to the IEA because the IEA inspectors will go into the facilities and verify that the nuclear material is, is located as it's declared to be, but also the quantity, the type of nuclear material. 
There are several types of, of, of inspection, but I won't go into uh, detail um, here. Uh, regarding subsidiary arrangements, I already uh, described that. And just to be complete, there are also some administrative measures related to the inspector designation, but also the visa, because obviously state uh, inspectors, when they arrive in state, they need to have a visa to conduct their verification activities. And lastly, IEA inspectors are entitled to certain privileges and immunities in the context of their duties. I think I will have to sk skip the small quantity protocol, but just in a nutshell to tell you, all safeguards measures in part two are pretty heavy for states. And so the IA decided un, under the decision of the board, of course, to have small quantity protocol. This protocol is available for states with very little or no nuclear material. And for these states, the safeguards measured provided in part two will not be applicable as long as they fulfill the condition that they have a certain very limited quantity of nuclear material but also that there are no nuclear material in the facility. This is the original small quantity protocol of 1974, and there was a modified version in 2005, so the board adopted a new version on the, on the advice on, uh, of the director general. So now the conditions are the following, still minimal or no nuclear material subject to safeguards, but also not available to state with already have existing facilities or planned facilities. It means if I'm a state and I'm deciding I'm going to build, I'm going to start to build in two years a nuclear facility, I am not eligible anymore to have this uh, small quantity protocol. So this, regarding the safeguards coverage with uh, under, sorry, the comprehensive safeguard agreement, well, if you remember the previous scheme, here we have more components of the nuclear fuel cycle where safeguards are applied. In spent fuel storage, also in enrichment. So the IEA has more access, more knowledge, more information on the nuclear fuel cycle in a state in order to perform its verification activities. Let's move to the addition protocol to safeguards agreement. So this is the Tuwaitha Nuclear Research Center in Iraq in 91. And under the comprehensive safeguard agreement, um, IE inspectors were going to decide to verify these uh, facilities in red. But this is what was discovered later on, that on the same site, there were many other nuclear facilities which normally would have had to be declared to the agency. So following this situation, the IEA started an internal reflection on how to better detect undeclared nuclear facilities because these were not declared to the agency. And the IEA had, already, had, had only the right to access these declared facilities. Well, there was an entire reflection within the agency on how to strengthen the, the, the safeguard system. These are the main uh, steps. So first, the Board of Governors reaffirmed the right of the agency to conduct special, special inspection to verify the absence of undeclared nuclear activities and material in a state. This voluntary reporting scheme, or VRS, was adopted by many states, and these states decided on a voluntary basis to provide information on import and export of nuclear material, but no more comprehensive information on import and export of nuclear material. So the IEA had more a global view of the transfers of nuclear material between states. And this is the main element. The Director General decided to set up a team in uh, the agency, and this team was, tas was tasked to 
think about ways to strengthen the safeguards system. This led to recommendations presented to the Board of Governors, and there were two parts in these recommendations. First, part one measures. These were measures such as environmental sampling, which were already, I would say, applicable under the existing authority by that time of the agency. And part two measures were measures which required additional legal authority for the agency to be conducted. And this led in uh, May 1997 for the Board of Governors to approve the model additional protocol which contains these part two measures which required additional legal uh, authority to be conducted. And this is the additional protocol. It's a bigger document than the comprehensive um, safeguard agreement. To come back to one of your questions, the additional protocol is not a standalone document. So to have an additional protocol, you need to have a safeguard agreement in force. A state can't have only an additional protocol in force. Yeah, yeah. Because I was about to say, this additional protocol is concluded on a voluntary basis. So the state will ask to conclude uh, an additional protocol with the agency. This is a model, meaning that unlike the Information Circular 153, so the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement, the state here has to accept all provisions set out in this document in the additional protocol. No space for flexibility with regards to the provisions in the additional protocol. There are currently 128 states with an additional protocol in force. And similarly to a comprehensive safeguard agreement, there are subsidiary arrangements, so how the measures contained in the additional protocol will be implemented. But unlike the comprehensive safeguard agreement, here it's not an obligation to have subsidiary arrangements. These are the new things that, new instruments, new tools given to the IEA when conducting its verification activities. Broader information, broader access, a simplified process for the designation of inspectors, but also the delivery of multiple entry visa, an enhanced confidentiality regime on the IEA side, and finally the right to use communication system including satellites for inspectors. So what do we mean by broader information? Well now the IEA will have a complete overview of all nuclear and nuclear-related activities in the states. Why? Because under the additional protocol, the state has the obligation to provide information on research and development. Very uh, concrete example, nuclear-related activities undertaken in universities. These have to be declared to the agency under the additional protocol. Also, more elements provided regarding the export of nuclear material. And the, the model additional protocol is a bigger document because in the annex, it's a list of all nuclear-related uh, nuclear equipment which have to be, uh, I would say, notified to um, the IEA. Unlike the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement, the state have now the obligation to provide information on mines and milling activities. But also, this is the last one I will mention, the general 10-year plan relevant to the development of the nuclear fuel cycle. So under the additional protocol, the states have the obligation to say what are their 10-year plan related to the nuclear fuel cycle. Regarding complementary access, the complementary access, it's not an inspection. It's an access. So this is something to be distinguished. The complementary access can be conducted with a two-hour notice to any place on a site. So if we come back to the, the, the nuclear re, uh, research center in Iraq, under 
this complementary access, IEA inspectors could have said, okay, I want to go there and I'm going to be there in two hours. This was not possible by that time without the additional protocol, but now it's possible. But this two hour notice is only applicable when the, the inspectors are already there to conduct an inspection. Otherwise, it's 24 hour notice. And very important, the IE inspectors can't just go like that all the time on complementary access. This has to be justified. Three justification, to assure the absence of undeclared nuclear material activities, to resolve question or inconsistencies. For example, we receive information from a state, something is unclear about activities in a specific facility. Then the IEA will say, well, we will conduct a complementary access specifically for the purpose to resolve an inconsistency. And last possibility is to confirm the decommissioned uh, status. No, because we, here we have access to any place on a site. For inspection, it's only on specific facilities, and there are strategic points on these facilities. Okay? So this is really into detail, but in the say, subsidiary arrangement, you will have strategic points, so areas in the nuclear facility. The states and IEA will agree on these strategic points, so we'll determine these strategic points, and safeguards measures will be applied only in these strategic points, so measurements, containment and surveillance uh, of activities, etc. Here, it's literally everywhere. This is why I insisted this is not an inspection. This is going far beyond what the, the legal authority provided in the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement. Here, it's under the additional protocol. But this is not, this is not a st on, uh, conducted on a standard basis. Inspections under the Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement are conducted on a standard basis. For this, we have to justify it. So for states with both comprehensive safeguard agreement and additional protocol in force, if I come back again to the simplified picture of the nuclear fuel cycle, it seems that everything is covered because the IEA has now information on all the components of the nuclear fuel cycle and even on aspect taking place in research centers or laboratories without nuclear material, but conducting nuclear-related research, for example. So last part of the presentation is the way safeguards are implemented now. So this is the overview as, uh, as July 2017. So as I mentioned, we have voluntary offered uh, safeguard agreement for the five nuclear weapon states. For the main part of safeguard agreement for the non-nuclear weapon states, we have comprehensive safeguard agreement in 173 states. And for 123 states, sorry, we have both comprehensive safeguard agreement and additional protocol. And as I mentioned, these item-specific safeguard agreement for Pakistan, India, and Israel, so non NPT states, because they have no obligation under the NPT as they are not state parties to the NPT. <coughs> Every year, the DG will report on the implementation of safeguards in this safeguards implementation report, and the IA will draw different conclusion based on the type of agreement in force. Of course, if the IA has a comprehensive safeguard agreement and an additional protocol in a state, we can conclude that all nuclear material remain in peaceful purposes. But if we don't have all this information, this, this information which has to be provided under both comprehensive safeguard agreement and additional protocol, then we cannot conclude that all nuclear material are in peaceful activities, but we will conclude that declared nuclear material are in peaceful activities. So in a nutshell, Safeguards verification activities are based on safeguards agreements, which are legally binding instruments. Reporting and access requirements are provided for in safeguards agreements and the protocols thereto. And safeguards implementation, all the activities conducted by the IEA have the objective that the states 
are meeting their obligation under the legal instruments. I thank you for your attention. It was very quick. I hope it was not too complicated right after lunch, but I'm very happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Thank you.